Just to reiterate, I'm John Hauser. I'm the, the, the Chief Information Officer at the Historical Society of Pennsylvania. And I did a presentation last year which covered some of the same ground. But at that point, we were still in development mode and we hadn't gone live with anything. And so I thought it would be interesting to look over the slides and edit them based on our experience going live and, and what we're actually doing now. And uh, things worked pretty well, but you'll see there were some changes. Um, and I've used the OK stamp on the slides that didn't need changing. <laughs> so um, a little bit about the Historical Society, just so you know sort of the context for what we're doing. We are one of the oldest historical societies in the country. Uh, we have more than 600,000 printed items and um, more than 21 million manuscript uh, items, including uh, a strong collection of uh, documents pertaining to the period of the uh, revolution in this country and the founding of this country. Um, we have very active programs in education, digitization, and uh, digital history, that is interpreted history, uh, and we are continually digitizing um, from our collections. So if we look here, I've made corrections. <laughs> uh, we have multiple Drupal uh, websites, a discovery system based on ViewFind, uh, now more than 556,000 records in our discovery system. Uh, those are a combination of MARC records from our printed materials, EAD records from our archivist toolkit uh, database, database uh, so archival records, uh, records from our digital asset management system, and names from our genealogy databases. So we'll look at those different record types, and the fact that we have those different record types has been a driver for utilizing some of the features that we use heavily in ViewFind, particularly the ability to create separate record drivers and create custom displays in your theme based on the type of record that you're displaying. So I pointed out last year that we were embarking on a new program to sort of change how we serve our members online and that the point of that was to make things more findable, accessible, and useful online. We've had a tradition of welcoming scholars to come and use our archival collections in the building, but not such a strong tradition of helping people utilize them from overseas or from, um, uh, from other locations, uh, partly because there is just so much uh, material there and so much digitization to do. But we did uh, go through a program of bumping up the resolution uh, of our images and making them um, and enhancing our document viewer to allow zooming in at high resolution. That has worked quite well. And you can get a lot of detail from our digital assets now. Although, I must say, we have a huge problem with our document viewer, which is the viewer we use when we have a multi image document, uh, like a book that's been scanned or a manuscript that's been scanned with multiple pages. And um, boy, if you know any plugins for uh, websites that, uh, any better viewer projects, we want to know about them. We may end up sponsoring one ourselves because we're really not happy with what we've got now. So this is what we thought, well, this was the development version. Um, Pretty straightforward viewfind, horrible little logo that we just threw together, um, and so forth. This is what it actually ended up looking like with um, a slightly better logo. It's still a very simple, straightforward design. I will um, uh, show you, uh, demonstrate this a little bit later and can bump up the size so you can see it a little better when I do that. Um, what 
we've done with it isn't so much graphical as it is to utilize the record drivers. And the one thing that I would point out is over on the right-hand side where you can see we have the published materials, the names, digital records, and archival materials. Um, and we've made those into a facet. And you can choose the record source uh, right there by doing, using the facet. Um, this was uh, the login screen for our system. And we thought we were going to come out in January. We came out in February. Not too bad. Um, this was the pre-release of the um, genealogy databases, which I'll demonstrate a little bit more later. They didn't change too much. Um, but we did, we have uh, gone through actually three iterations of the software since uh, last year. We came out with our first version with uh, uh, three databases. We later added two more databases, and then we upgraded from viewfind. Well, we had gone from one to two for this, for the development version, and then we went from two something to two four one eventually. So we're almost at the latest at this moment. So um, our databases for genealogy tend to be small, uh, less than 3,000 records for many of them. Uh, these are created uh, by transcribing uh, physical documents in many cases, things like ledgers or registration books. Um, and I'll show you a little bit of that later. There's not a lot of text to them. Um, and we expect to be adding in the next few years at least 10 more that we have in the works. We will have four more next month in theory, uh, although I'm a little behind in starting work on the next version of this. So I'm expecting maybe sometime um, January, February, we'll come out with another version with more databases. It's static data. And for that reason, um, we, we uh, didn't feel the need for a database backend for this stuff. So it's really, it exists in the form of XML, source documents, and viewfind, uh, the solar index. It doesn't exist as a separate searchable database. But the process for loading it is staff enter data into Excel spreadsheets. Um, I write a Perl script to convert that into XML. The XML is loaded directly into Solar. There is no mark um, crosswalk. Uh, we don't use the indexing scripts, the, the default indexing scripts for mark. Uh, we've uh, completely bypassed those. This was what a source document uh, would look like in the system, although the fields have changed a little bit. But the thing to notice here is that the red field names all use the standard um, extensions that you can use that allow you to create fields without defining them in solar first, um, so long as you have the underscore string or the underscore text, one of those um, things, those field names, those, those um, uh, it will create indexes for you of certain defined, predefined types. So what were the key decisions? Um, the first decision was that we didn't need a backend database. The data was static. The uh, edits could be made. Uh, any edits could be made in XML in the, in the source files uh, after they were loaded. Um, one thing that I have found with this is that things are not as static as I would have liked. And we've been requested to make corrections to the data on a, on a regular basis. The, it turns out some of our source files were not very accurate. And we also converted a number of source, source files that had been indexed by Ancestry.com. And they did a very poor job of it. And so our staff have decided they want to clean up a lot of that data. And now the fact that we don't have a database backend is not really a problem, but 
um, it's a little bit more cumbersome than uh, it would otherwise be. So we're, at, we're ending up editing XML files and then re-indexing them when we want to make changes. But fortunately, we have staff who are more than capable of doing that. Another database was um, that we would, or a decision was that we would share a single viewfind instance for these things, which does mean that we had to define some standard indexes that would be shared across all of our genealogy databases. And that is harder than it sounds. There aren't, these databases are wildly different in content. Um, but there were a few key things that we could index with everything, and then we supplement with some special indexes for each database. Um, the key indexes tend to be things like names, addresses, uh, and years. I can't do full dates usually, but years. Um, these things are key to looking up genealogy records anywhere you go. Um, another decision we made was that they, the databases would be organized into collections. Um, Viewfind does support hierarchical collections and collection browsing, and we do utilize that to some degree. Although we really, um, most of our databases are not related to one another at this point. We will see more of a hierarchy as we, as we go forward. Um, we decided that the field structure would utilize uh, the solar dynamic fields. That's what I was talking about when you use the standard underscore TXT or uh, STR. Then you don't have to define your fields in solar. It just saves us a lot of time um, in con and uh, configuration for solar, and that has worked very well. We really haven't found the need to do more than that. Um, each database will get its own record driver. That's worked really well, and I'll show you what we can do with that. So um, some of the lessons learned, many of the viewfind functions, um, particularly, um, well, the solar mark and solar default stuff, the associated templates, they kind of assume mark or Dublin core-like bibliographic fields, uh, and we have to work around some things, uh, especially in our Discover system where we're combining both MARC and non-MARC records. Uh, that can get a little bit awkward. Um, as I pointed out, you, don't, you want to think carefully before dumping the title and author fields. Uh, <laughs> they're really extensively used. Um, and you should create a separate record driver for collections. Um, it helps a lot to have that. So here were some references. And these slides will be available later, so I'm not going to stay on those. Um, this is key to what happens, um, uh, what we can do with the record drivers. This is a, a search result that I've uh, just blown up a little bit, uh, a search for B Benjamin Chu. Um, Chu family is, a, is huge in this area, and we have, it's our single largest archival collection. Um, takes a whole floor of the place, practically, in one of our vaults. Um, but what you can see here is that this is an initial search result, and the displays associated, these are three different record types and three different displays, and they are so different and can be easily made so different because they each have a unique record driver and there's a, a separate template for each record driver. Um, this is uh, in, the, in the theme. Um, so this is what you can do with record drivers. The first one is a result from our digital library. Um, the second one is a result uh, from our, uh, an EAD record uh, in our archival collections. And the third result is uh, from one of our, is a name uh, from one of our genealogy databases. So that's the, present, the slides. And I'll do a little bit of demo just to show you what this looks like. So here's our Discover system. And if I, search for someone like Benjamin Rush, whose name you might have heard from, 
heard he was uh, one of the pioneers in research on yellow fever. And we have a lot of materials pertaining to him. And you can see that we have published materials, archival records, digital records, and names all associated with him. And if I look at these things, you'll see how different they look. So here's a more or less traditional kind of uh, bibliographic record for a printed material item. Look at the archival materials. So there's a collection, an archival collection, completely different set of fields in a different order with a link to the finding aid. And I don't know how familiar you are with um, archival collections, but they describe not so much items as boxes of things, so they work quite different than a regular bibliographic record. Um, then we have digital records, and those would be links to images. And let's see, it was already open, that's why. <laughs> so that'll take us into our uh, digital asset management system, a nice uh, engraving of Benjamin Rush. And we have names. 258,000 names extracted from various databases. The databases indicated um, there are three different databases here that Benjamin Rush shows up in. I'm going to show you the record from the Oliver H. Bear Company records. These were, um, they are indexed cards from a funeral home in this area that was in operation for a great many years. And uh, for genealogists, they, there's a wealth of information about family names, family relationships, addresses, and periods when people lived in particular locations, all of which is of great interest to genealogists. Um, these things um, are actually behind a paywall, so you have to be logged into our proxy server to get to this encounter system. But Encounters is the uh, genealogy system. And here's where we have a bunch of different databases. The records in here have a little bit more detail. And then they have a link often also to the actual card image at Ancestry.com. Uh, Ancestry indexed this and digitized this particular collection some years ago. We had an arrangement with this. And um, so by going through our proxy server, we can actually link directly to the image uh, of the funeral record. So this index card indicates um, basically who died and who paid for the funeral and uh, what the relationship was and what they paid, often their address. So this is very rich data for genealogists. And we have many thousands of these records. Just a little bit more with encounters. This uh, is the top level and shows the keys, the different databases that we have now. And again, we'll have about four more in the next few months. And each one of these has its own record driver. So again, our search results can vary a little bit uh, from record to record. And here's where you'll see the greatest difference, where these fields may be completely different for, uh, for each database. 
and we've also been able to provide um, information about related collections. This is a link to the finding aid. This is a link to an essay about the collection. This is a, a database description. And these are different for each database. And so having the record driver, again, allows me to vary these displays uh, for each database. All within ViewFind. That's it. Um, I hope this has been helpful. Any questions I can answer? Yeah, um, it would be a lot harder to map the different data types uh, for a useful calendar display across archival records where you have a whole range of years uh, and bibliographic records where you have one year and names where the years don't always mean the same thing. So it's, it would be very messy to do that and discover in, in encounters we generally have a year, although the years do vary in their meaning from database to database. So in one database, it might be a visit date. In another database, it might be the date of an entry in a ledger. And in another database, it might be the year of birth of the person referred to in the record. So it's even messy there, but we thought, it, but genealogists really, really like to be able to search by date. And uh, so we made a particular effort to make it available here. Um, there's a, uh, this was partly a problem because of the, uh, the indexing work that Ancestry did where they were, the way they index things, a lot of records don't actually have dates in them, too. <laughs> but anyway, we, we managed to do it. And we really like the, the, um, the date tool um, because you can create a date range just by, it's, a, it's an active tool. Um, and it populates the, the date range uh, thing, which you can also use to control the range. So we, um, we worked hard to make that useful. Is that something you were oh, no, no, no. That comes with, when did that appear first? That's actually been around since 2021. It's something that's off by default. Yeah. <laughs> Other questions? No, we work with the XML. Um, the conversion that I do from spreadsheet to XML is pretty much one way. Uh, and so the reference file for the database becomes the XML. And uh, if, if I need to, for some of these databases, we could easily load that into a database from the XML and make it editable through that kind of interface. I would not have set up this process of going from a spreadsheet to XML if I were starting the project from the beginning. But uh, they started compiling the information for the databases before I joined the organization. And they were well underway with many databases worth of, or many spreadsheets worth of data before I got there. So. I really have had to, to deal with that. The problem, of course, with a spreadsheet, especially used by a relatively naive user, is that it doesn't really do any validation. And so we get a lot of very messy data. And sometimes we even get columns that don't line up and other problems like that that I have to work out in the conversion process. So I would rather have a database interface to, to, to enter the data from these uh, documents but um, we've managed. It helps. I do, um, I do those scripts in Perl, and I've been doing Perl a long time. So um, I'm able to manage that. 
Okay, well, thank you very much.